today on Grace To You. Wesley and Whitfield instruct us concerning the person of Jesus Christ in this hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. Born to save the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. And that birth is how the New Testament begins. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm always glad when uh, Christmas comes around because I finally had the opportunity to sing one of my favorite hymns, and it's only sung around Christmas. Uh, that hymn is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It is not only my favorite Christmas carol, but it is one of my very favorite hymns. And uh, I'm not alone. In 1872, the Church of England selected the four greatest hymns in the English language, and Hark the Herald Angels was one of those hymns. I wait all year to sing this hymn. <laughs> and then I find myself singing it and humming it to myself all through the season. It is a tribute to our Savior, our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is one of the greatest treasures that the church has musically. and. It is a treasure to the mind and soul of everyone who has memorized the incredible words to this hymn. It was originally written in 1739 by Charles Wesley, who wrote it as a Christmas Day hymn. Fifteen years later, along came George Whitfield, the great preacher, great evangelist. And he uh, felt that the, um, the words needed a little bit of uh, editing, so he Calvinized it. <laughs> and fifteen years after the original work of, of Wesley, Whitfield brought its lyrics into the familiar form that we sing today. It, um, it needed a tune, and uh, the years went by, and Wesley had always said it needs a kind of a somber, slow tune, but it never really caught on with that kind of tune. And then about a hundred years after Whitfield, in the mid-1800s, there was a famous German Jew who was baptized a Christian, baptized into the Christian faith. This German Jew wrote a cantata in the honor of Johann Gutenberg, who invented the printing press. And in that cantata, there was an amazing tune, and that is the tune that since about 1850 has been associated with Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and that German Jew who converted to Christ was Felix Mendelssohn. So when you get a song that has Wesley, Whitfield, and Mendelssohn, it's going to be good. And it is good. It is the best. I know you know it, but I, I can't go any further really without reminding you of the words, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold Him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate Deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail, the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail, the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, 
born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. And there are at least three other verses that are not in the hymnal. Great hymn, just an incomparable hymn, and every verse ends with glory to the newborn King. Wesley and Whitfield instruct us concerning the person of Jesus Christ in this hymn. He is the newborn King, but He is also identified as the Prince of Peace, the Son of Righteousness, the Everlasting Lord, the Incarnate Deity, and most of all, Emmanuel, God with us. It's an almost breathtaking Christology in this magnificent tribute. And by the way, this is Christianity. Christianity is that God, the Eternal Son, left heaven, came to earth as a baby born to a woman miraculously without a human father, born to save the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. That is Christianity. And that birth is how the New Testament begins. So let's go to the beginning in the book of Matthew and the very first chapter. We're going to look at Matthew's account of the birth of the King. First of all, the virgin birth conceived, and we'll look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. This is just such a simple explanation of a staggering, incomprehensible divine miracle. The Bible does that a lot, simply states things that are beyond our comprehension. We don't know anything about Mary, really. We know nothing about her family, what they did. But we do know about her character, which is what is most important, because in Luke chapter 1, in verse 38, Mary says in response to being told by Gabriel, the archangel, that she's going to be the mother of the most holy child, the Son of God, she says, "'Behold the slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to Your word.'" This is a thirteen-year-old girl or so who sees herself as a slave of the Lord, a willing, loving slave of the Lord who wants only to do whatever the Lord asks her to do. She is a worshiper over in verse 46. In response to this, she says, "'My soul exalts the Lord, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for He has, regarded for, uh, has had regard for the humble state of His slave. For behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name.'" And she goes on to quote Old Testament passages in that beautiful Magnificat. She is theologically astute. She knows God. She knows the attributes of God. She knows the Old Testament. She's a godly young girl. Now she is, it says in verse 18, betrothed to Joseph. You have to understand Jewish marriage contracts were a little different than we have today. People get engaged and disengaged and engaged and disengaged, and we've all become pretty used to that happening. Um, in the Jewish plan of marriage, when you were engaged or betrothed, that was, that was a binding legal covenant. You literally bound yourself for life to the one that you had desired to marry. You can find that back in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 7. Betrothal was a legal contract demanding, defining two people as committed to one another for life. Betrothal was a trial period. There was no consummation during betrothal. That came after the actual marriage ceremony. There were usually several months during the betrothal period. What was that for? 
Well, in some ways that the husband needed to make preparations for the wedding, that would be an extensive uh, responsibility that he would have. But even more than that, it was a trial time to see if the person that you had committed to would be faithful to that covenant. It was a time to prove your holiness, your virtue, and your righteousness. It was clearly before they came together that they had been betrothed. So they were set by covenant, by legal contract for a marriage. But this was the trial period to find out if the person would be faithful. And back to verse 18, before they came together, before they were actually married, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. The worst possible scenario was that a betrothed woman would become pregnant. That's why you had the trial period, to prove her integrity, her virtue. She was pregnant. She was about three months pregnant, if you calculate what the New Testament says, at this time when Joseph gets the information. By the way, she knew she was pregnant. How did she know? Luke 1, 26, because the angel Gabriel came to her when they were back in Nazareth and said, um, behold, don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God, verse 30, 31, behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son, you shall name Him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. He will reign over the throne of Jacob forever, and His kingdom will have no end. He's the king. Now Joseph found out that she was pregnant. I can't imagine the shock and devastation because this is a virtuous girl that he knows and loves and is committed to for life. And he finds out that she is pregnant. And according to Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24, if a betrothed woman became pregnant, she was to be stoned to death. So a cloud of suspicion and shame and scandal is hanging over her head because she doesn't know how to explain this. This is, there's really no precedent for this. There's no way to explain it. In all human history, there's never been a virgin birth. And now Joseph is in shock because he's found out that she is pregnant and he can't understand it. And so in verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Righteousness is a wonderful word. It embodies um, holiness, virtue, morality, but it also embodies compassion. Part of being righteous is being compassionate. This is a righteous man. You might say, well, if he was a righteous man, he'd make a public display out of her. A righteous man would uphold righteousness and a righteous man would would um, make this public and say, she has been unfaithful, I want to declare her unfaithfulness, we're going to bring her before the appropriate witnesses and we're going to deal with this thing publicly because she needs to be a warning sign concerning this kind of sin. But there is inherently within true righteousness compassion and deep affection and love. He, he loves her, He cares for her, He doesn't understand what has happened, He has no explanation for it, but His heart is compassionate toward her. And so we saw the virgin birth conceived in verse 18, and now the virgin birth is confronted in verses 19 and 20. It's confronted by, by Joseph. They're betrothed. He's a righteous man, that is, he desires to do what is 
pleasing to God. You could even say that He has been declared righteous by faith in God in the same way that all Old Testament saints had. Certainly Mary was one of them. He is a true Old Testament saint, justified before God by faith. The justification of that man and even the transformation of that man's heart is evidence in his uh, obedience to God, his desire to obey God, to marry a godly, virtuous woman, and to also demonstrate compassion. Mary was precious to him, the girl of his hopes, but he had to do what was right. But he doesn't want to disgrace her, back to verse 19, wanting not to disgrace her. There's no bitterness. There's no anger. There's no hostility. There's no desire to make a display out of her, just confusion and compassion. Two courses are really open to him at this point. The harshest would be to make a public example of her. And even though capital punishment as a punishment for sin had disappeared in the history of Israel, there, there was still the threat of a public divorce, a bill of divorce, a public lawsuit against her. And she would be brought into some kind of court, and um, there would be witnesses coming into the court to testify against her that she was pregnant and that Joseph was not the father. In ancient times, she, she would have been stoned to death. But in more recent times, during the time of their life, divorce had taken the place of stoning. He could have had a public divorce and sort of exonerated himself, but he doesn't want to do that. So he decided to. It says at the end of verse 19, send her away secretly. However, verse 20 says, when he had considered this, he was in the middle of considering it, meditating on it. Apparently he falls asleep, mulling over in his mind what he's going to do with this love of his life. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I don't understand the, the reality of that. I don't know how to define that. It says a dream, and yet it says an angel of the Lord actually appeared to him in a dream. This is a supernatural experience. That's all we can say. That's all we need to know. An angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, again reiterating that he is in the royal line. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit." This is stunning, shocking. It's the same message that Mary heard back in Luke 1, the child will be produced by the Holy Spirit, this will be a holy child, this will be the Son of God. So Joseph is now trying to figure out just exactly how do I fit into that. Little wonder then that when the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, fear was the first reaction of Joseph. Stop being afraid. You can take her as your wife. She is not so transcendent. She is not so holy. She is not so elevated that she cannot be your wife. What has been conceived in her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. She will bear a son. Doesn't say she will bear you a son. Never says that. In Luke 1 13, the Lord said to Zacharias, Elizabeth will bear you a son because you are a participating father. That is never said to Joseph. It's just, she will bear a son. This is Mary's son, and this is God's son. This is not Joseph's son. And by the way, throughout the, the second chapter of Matthew, 
Mary is identified as His mother, and Joseph is never stated as His father, never. Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Take your child, arise, take the young child and his mother, go into the land of Israel. This is not Joseph's son. This is God's son. This is Mary's son. In fact, in the second chapter of Matthew, God says, out of Egypt have I called my son. Jesus was God's son and Mary's son, never Joseph's son. The mystery of all of this is profound and confounding. And when it says down in verse 25 that He kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, I can fully understand that, that He wouldn't want to do anything to touch her. It was not legal to do that anyway, just because they hadn't had the marriage ceremony. But I think it would have been hard to imagine Himself even putting a hand on such a set-apart and anointed life chosen by God for such singular calling. But Joseph, you do have a role to play. Father gives the name. So verse 21, you shall call His name Jesus, Yeshua, Old Testament Joshua, for He will save His people from their sins. Yeshua means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. That's His name, Jesus, Jehovah saves, for He will save His people from their sins. So He is the Savior. He's the only Savior. He's the Savior of the world. There is no other Savior. It is God and God alone who saves His people, and He does it through the work of His Son, Jesus. There's no salvation in any other, Acts 4.12. Who is able to save? Who is mighty to save? Only the virgin-born God-man, Son of David, Son of Mary. And then in verses 22 and 23, you have the virgin birth connected connected. We saw it conceived and confronted, clarified uh, in regard to the name as the message came to Joseph. But here it's connected, and it's connected to an Old Testament prophecy. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call His name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. That is a direct quote from Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7, 14. Here, Matthew shows us that the virgin birth was promised, was promised. And if you go back to Isaiah 7, 14, that's exactly what you read with the addition of just an opening statement. Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and will call His name Emmanuel. The Lord will give you a sign. Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul puts it this way, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born of a woman, but the Son of God. It's a final word, the virgin birth completed in the last two verses. Joseph awoke from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, took Mary as his wife. They had the wedding ceremony kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and He called His name Jesus. He got the message, believed it, and named her son Yeshua, Jehovah saves, because He came to save His people from their sins. He kept her a virgin, by the way, until she gave birth to a son, which means that He didn't keep her a virgin after that. And that's clear in the New Testament because Jesus had brothers and sisters born to Joseph and Mary, and they're named and referred to. She was not a perpetual virgin. She had many other children, but not until after Jesus was born did Joseph come near her. So that's the story. That's the story from Matthew. Paul looks at that same story in these words. He. The Lord Jesus Christ existed in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason God highly exalted Him, bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those in heaven and earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." The supernatural birth of Jesus is the only way you can account for His life. An unbeliever once said to a Christian, if I told you that a child had been born without a father, would you believe it? The Christian answered, yes, if he lived as Jesus lived. The King is revealed. His birth proves who He is. In Christ, God came to dwell with us, with the sick to heal them, with the demonized to liberate them, with the poor in spirit to bless them, with the meek to lift them up to His kingdom, with the fearful and guilty to free them from care and dread, with, with the lepers to cleanse them, with the disease to cure them, with the hungry to feed them, but most of all, with the lost to seek and save them. Through His poverty, we are made rich. The King is born. For all of us at Christmas season, there is a sense of madness, isn't there? Um, no holiday all year long is so widely celebrated by the world around us as Christmas is, and yet it seems as if Christ is absent in virtually all of the celebration. How can that happen? How can it be a celebration of the birth of Christ and somehow He be left out? But that's how it is. For us as believers, on the other hand, we have to cut through the clutter and set aside all of the nonsense that tends to smother the reality of the birth of Christ and joyfully and thankfully and with worshiping hearts focus on the greatest gift that God has ever given the unspeakable gift of His Son, our Savior. And I hope this Christmas season you'll be able to focus on Him, that you'll be able in time with family and friends and even non-believers to be able to make Christ the issue, to bring Him to the front, to bring Him to the fore. That, of course, is the desire of the Lord Himself, and that would be our desire for you, and I know it's your desire as well. So let's do this. Let's make Christ the real center of Christmas. And we thank you for being a part of the ministry of Grace to You. We hope that we have helped to focus you on Christ all year long and can give you a little bit of an impetus even at this Christmas season. Continue to pray for us. Continue to uphold our ministry before the Lord as we go into a new year with all kinds of marvelous opportunities to be faithful, to proclaim the Christ that we especially worship at this Christmas season.